is a dental surgery. So we decided to give her the, uh, uh, a pass on this particular, uh, this particular event. Uh, we're absolutely delighted today as we're talking about the mediation topic that seldom gets touched on in the uh, first year of curriculum, but uh, something that's becoming a uh, bigger and bigger part of the legal profession is mediation, part of the rubric of alternative uh, dispute resolution, and nowhere can it be more prominent than in family law. And we're absolutely delighted to have today Diane Mercer, who's one of our graduates, who seems to be, at least since I've been here at the law school, uh, making an annual pilgrimage back to <laughs> Indiana, uh, Bloomington, uh, to do, among other things, just get back to the, uh, 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 to the law school. And she has a particularly inspiring story, at least in my uh, in my uh, in my uh, in my uh, class, my morning uh, section, we've talked a little bit about how the law changes and how uh, the law changes. And we think, on the one hand, if you look at it from the point of view of the law changing, and it just it seems like our options are winnowing. Uh, but the flip side is, is it creates other opportunities. And I think uh, Diane has a story to tell about the, the flip side of, uh, of the, the law changing and creating opportunities. For, uh, to do new things to really add value in a substantial way uh, to the lives of her clients. And so with that, I want to welcome Diane Mercer, 1988 grad of Indiana Law School. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in absorbed in conversation with our guest, Diane, so now you're part of the conversation. So I graduated in 1988, it was also a recession, and uh, I went to IU undergrad also in North Central High School in Indianapolis. Um, when I went to school here, this class I think was once a week, so you guys must really need help. California, so I was really glad to have this school on file. So this class prepares you very well. Um, you know, I had okay grades in law school. I was pretty firmly in the bottom 90% of the class. <laughs> These for diploma. <laughs> 1988 was also a recession, and I had to send out 500 snail mail resumes to get a job. This is pre-internet, right? So I initially practiced with a three-person firm in New Haven, Connecticut, which I now affectionately refer to as Shaft, Enema, and Grief. Um, <laughs> after, uh, after a year of practicing, it was so demoralizing because it was so awful. I was really thinking I'd made a really grievous error going to law school, and I started to look into a career change, and I started looking for another job. So um, I'm going to do a little workshop tonight on finding a job in a recession tonight at 5.30, so I'll tell you more about that little odyssey at that point. But my next job was in a 12-lawyer law firm. I was the only female, and I was also the only non-Italian. Um, I'd never done family law before, but I kind of BS'd my way into it because I, there was no way I was going to go back and work at Shaft Enum in grief. So anything else I figured I would figure out. So when my new boss figured out that I had no idea what I was doing, he was extremely unhappy. But for some reason, he managed to give me another chance. And so I dedicated my book, Your Divorce Advisor, to him. Um, I've conveniently forgotten a copy of it, but I'll bring it to the afternoon class. Um, so in a few years, I noticed how partner-heavy that law firm was, and then I also realized that my boss's son was in law school, and I was on the bottom of the associate ranks, even though I'd been there, I don't know, three or four years. And so I'd always dreamt of making partners, so I made myself a partner by starting a new firm with a colleague, uh, Nancy Noyes, and this is in New Haven, Connecticut. And so generally, you need to create your own opportunities. When you let your accomplishments speak for themselves, they'll whisper. So. If I'd known her solo practice was $60,000 in debt, I might have made a different decision, but it's like so many children, you know, have, or like so many things, like having children comes to mind. If you knew how difficult it was going to be, you probably never would have attempted it to begin with. Um, but in the end, it turned out to be worth it. So that was when I started killing people. <laughs> um, we did exclusively family law, and this is really what created, I'd been admitted to practice, Oh, probably five or six years at this point, and um, I, we were doing exclusively family law. And really, I think the bottom line is, is if you don't stress out about problems in your family, you don't stress out. And we all suffer equally. It doesn't matter what your socioeconomic class is. And so I had one client who was involved in a custody battle who killed herself. And then I won a big case. I was representing the husband, and the wife tried to kill herself the night that we won because um, she was so despondent over what had happened in family court. And then I was giving a final argument in a 
custody matter, I represented the mother and the father dropped dead during my final argument in the middle of court. So it was like, you know, it is really time to do something different in your life. <laughs> this is not really, you know, who I wanted to be. I was about 35 years old at that point and I was thinking, I, I don't have 30 more years of, of sort of wreaking this kind of havoc on people. So it was really time to be part of the solution and not part of the problem, which is when um, I got the opportunity to move to California and reinvent myself, so I took advantage of that. So 10 years out of school, I'm taking the California bar, which was pretty much murderous. So take whatever bar exams you're gonna take right when you get out of school, when you're used to studying and, and, um, and you're not so used to honing down the issues to what really matters, because the bar exam, they want you to point everything out. Um, so Peace Talks was my millennium resolution. And as much as it's a for-profit venture, the vision of it is to also take everything that people hate about the family law system and, and, and do it a different way. And to uh, fix it is probably strong, but to do it a different way. Uh, do you have anything else you'd like me to talk about in particular? I've got talking points. Go into the talking points. Do you know about your practice? <laughs> Practice is really interesting. It's one of the only multidisciplinary practices in the country, and if you've been reading those model rules, you already know it, but that's against the rules. Um, <laughs> you know, when I was visiting my folks a couple of weeks ago, my dad goes, how come you're such a rebel? Like, he's taking it personally. I'm like, look, I'm taking on the legal profession. I'm taking on pretty much the whatever else is coming up. Don't really, this is not aimed at, aimed at you, Dad, in particular. Um, but really, in a family law case, about 80% of it is the emotional divorce and about 20% of it is the legal divorce. I mean, these are really not cases of first impression. They are complicated because they involve lots of areas of law. You need to know about ERISA, you need to know about you know, kind of mundane everyday stuff like financial planning and how mortgage lending works and this kind of stuff. Um, but the you know, family law itself per se is not all that legally complicated <coughs> most of the time. But People don't get married as a business deal, and then the legal system expects them to get divorced as a business deal. And so the, the incongruity there, I think, is really disarming to people, and that's really what gets people into trouble. The best predictor of how much a family law case is going to cost is not the complexity of the matter, it's the acrimony between the parties. So, you know, we've had really big money cases. Uh, one comes to mind where the husband had run off with the wife's yoga instructor, and they had an infant and a $22 million buyout of a, a company that the husband had sold. They got it done really fairly quickly because there was not a lot of acrimony and they were really committed to getting it done. Other people have nothing and fight forever. So um, the family law system really, it, I suppose probably no law is really just about the law, but because it does involve people and their personal problems, you really end up with a lot of a psychology component. So as a result, we do all of our mediations with a lawyer and a psychologist in the same room together as co-mediators. And it's one of the only practices that operates that way exclusively on a full-time basis. We've got 10 mediators on staff. Um, those people, <coughs> business-wise, operate as independent contractors. Um, and so we mi mix and ma match the uh, attorney mediator and therapist mediator pairs. We actually have an accountant and a certified divorce financial planner on staff too, so sometimes we'll mix it up with those people as well, but the idea is that we'll figure out what serves the clients the best and what it is they actually need. And the essence of mediation really is giving clients what they say they want in a way that they can hear it, um, and giving them what they say they want, what you know they need, and in a way that they can hear it. So th it can be pretty complex really. Um, and there's a lot going on in the mediation room. I don't know how people do it, just one person, because just the, dyna the dynamics of the two people. Once in a while you get, our, our uh, theory is the Sleeping Beauty theory, that you need to invite all of the witches to the party. So if somebody is gonna be a spoiler, you may as well have them come to the mediation, 